Right, here I am, a minute early. And what I'm going to speak about, or what we're going to learn about today, either or, is martyrdom, like uh, generically, I guess, or in general, like a brief rundown of uh, some of the most well-known. And then I'm going to focus on Auburn, who was the first uh, English martyr. And if I have time, I'm going to go on to one other early martyr and her story. So let's take a look overall at the concept and then we'll get on. So the original meaning of the Greek word martis, M-A-R-T-Y-S, was witness. So it didn't mean somebody who died uh, for their cause at that time. In this sense, so in the sense of a witness, it's often used in the New Testament. However, because the most memorable or striking or, you know, emphatic way that a Christian could um, pr provide that witness, I guess, or attest to the, to the strength of their witnessing was to, like, die, basically, rather than denying Christ or their faith. So the word soon began to be used in reference to one who wasn't only a witness, but specifically a witness unto death, as it were. And this the usage for this in the New Testament is present, at least implicitly, and that is in Acts 22.20 20 and Revelation 2.13. So the, the, very first, the very first Christian martyrs were Stephen, he is the first, and James. So they're both saints, Saint Stephen and Saint James. The story of Stephen's martyrdom is uh, right there in the Bible. And of the apostles who... So everybody other than John basically came to an, I won't say untimely end because obviously it's in God's sovereign plan, but they were martyred uh, with the exclusion of John who lived into relatively old age compared to them at least. But the most important martyrs were Peter and Paul who were both uh, put to death at the hands of the Romans um, in Rome. Clement of Rome uh, described them as God's athletes uh, contending for a heavenly prize or the heavenly prize, I guess, and also mentions a great multitude who were executed at the same time. And Peter's uh, martyrdom was a little unusual or unorthodox, as it were, no pun intended, um, because a apparently or allegedly at his own request, he was crucified upside down. But uh, maybe that's a whole new video. So, um, early on in the second century, Ignatius of Antioch described his own upcoming martyrdom as a way of attaining to God. That's his direct quote. And he urged also the Christians in Rome, the Roman Christians, not to make any effort at all to like plead on his behalf or to have him spared. Um, and during the first two centuries, the persecution ha hadn't quite uh, gathered pace as it did before it was um, finally kind of outlawed within Rome at least. I mean it's gone on to this day but it was more sporadic um, and less uh, methodological maybe um, because martyrdoms were not particularly frequent within those uh, first two centuries. Um, however the martyrs that were were highly esteemed by other Christians and held in um, a place of honour, basically. So Roman emperor-wise, as it were, Marcus Aurelius, you may have heard of him, um, he viewed their constancy or their commitment or their un unwavering like willingness to die as um, theatrical, basically, um, and his government's position was not completely clear either. So it made it easier and sometimes more difficult to like ascertain the reasons for the martyrdom because, um, you know, it, it was debated and not settled. Were Christians to be condemned as Christians because of specific charges or because of the crimes that the Roman state viewed as inherent within the Christian faith? And some of the accusations thrown around were, of course, cannibalism, um, incest, you know, as a result of the Lord's uh, Supper and, you know, calling everybody brother and sister. Um, that Those were just two. Atheism was another common charge against Christians because we did not believe in the pantheon, etc. So anyway, um, they were ordered to prove how 
they had abandoned Christianity basically, and they were to do so in in this manner by offering sacrifices to Roman gods. And uh, the Old Testament, for sure, is pretty explicit about uh, condemning such practices. So unsurprisingly, they refused to do it en masse and uh, were then executed summarily. So as time went on, um, there was a, a fresh emphasis, I guess, on martyrdom, which could and was um, regarded as a substitute for baptism, interestingly enough. So in the persecutions under Decius, which was uh, the middle of the third, like AD 250, and Diocletian, uh, hopefully you've heard of him in my past videos, he was at uh, 4th century, uh, 303 to 311, and that's his uh, rulership, not his life. The authentic um, acts of the early martyrs were often replaced by legendary accounts, pseudo epigraphia, just like made up stuff. Um, you know, as an example of this, not one of the versions of the death of Ignatius is genuine. So, and there are many to choose from. The earliest surviving Christian martyrologies um, are the Syrian Breviarium Syriacum, possibly, uh, and that's AD 411. So that's worth uh, having a look at. There are like various, as I said, Christian persecution. I don't know why my computer's making noises. Christian persecution has continued unabated up until this day. However, we went through, you know, um, quite a wide ranging. I know what it is. We went through quite a um, quite a bit, a long time in England, at least, for um, you know Christian persecution by Christians. And I really should make a video about that. But those are annulled. All those, uh, like for example, the Protestant martyrs. There's a, a, I think I have the book uh, actually. It's like just full of them. And of course, we martyred quite a few Catholics uh, as well. So yeah, I'll. I'll maybe get to that. Um, so that that 411, why am I doing it to myself? The Breviarium Syriacum and also the Hieronym, no, it's not, it's the Hi wow, Hieronymian-ish. And that's the mid fifth century. So just slightly after the other one. Um, and that purports to be by St. Jerome. And that is uh, rejected, that claim by critics. And Jerome, you may remember, actually, he wasn't quite martyred. Um, he wasn't quite martyred, but he was shot full of arrows and miraculously survived. So then mm, I can't remember how he actually came to an end. So, uh, yeah, so let's get on to Britain, England, more uh, accurately, because there was no... Uh, anyway, so... Album was won to Christ by um, a fugitive's praise of God, basically. The Roman Emperor Septimus uh, Severus uh, really detested Christianity. I mean, most of his fellows or predecessors, rather, um, weren't too fond, but he really did uh, hate us and our religion. And when he came to Britain in 208 AD, obviously, he found Christians living there and furious uh, for this very reason. He ordered them all to be put to the sword. And a Christian priest, who is often given the name um, Amphibolus, fled before the imperial wrath uh, was meted out. And in the town of Verulam, which is now named St. Albans, you may have like a foreshadowing of why, uh, lived a man called Alban, and he was a high-ranking Roman soldier. Um, and by the way, Christianity uh, came to England via the persecution of Christians. So fleeing the mainland uh, of you know, Europe as it is now. So something about the behaviour of Amphibolus, the uh, priest, led Alban to offer him shelter. And in spite of his uh, status, I guess, as like a, you know, a wanted hunted, uh, you know, greatly sought after refugee. Um, and Fibulus, even despite that, he never, ever ceased praising God. And his joy was so palpable and so tangible and so real to Alban that Alban was moved um, by it and by the display of it. And he asked how that could be, you know, how can you be under these uh, circumstances and yet still praise God? 
And he was, you know, obviously told about Christ and converted to Christianity brilliantly for his his own soul. So the governor learned that Albon was harboring a Christian fugitive at this point, and he sent soldiers to uh, retrieve, like to drag the priest in. They were met by a man in a priestly robe. However, uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't amphibolous. It was Albon. And when the governor saw this, he was apoplectic, basically. He was beyond furious. And since Alban had helped Amphibolus to escape, uh, he said Alban must bear the punishment that was due to the priest who obviously he'd got off. And at the moment, the governor was, at that moment, the governor was preparing to pour out a libation, which is a drink offering to his gods, which quite frankly could have been any of the pantheon. And now he ordered Alban to do the same. And obviously that would go against his newfound Christianity. And he even offered to spare him if he would show his loyalty to the old gods, as it were, by doing this libation. And Alban, unsurprisingly, uh, refused. And he said this, he said, I worship and adore the true and living God who created all things. God bless him. So after he was flogged, uh, for that, the governor again asked him to renounce his Christianity and once more Alban refused. And so the governor ordered his execution at that stage. And according to at least one legend, the place of execution was across a swollen river. And the townsfolk, uh, you know, because they didn't want to see him die, tore down the bridge. However, Alban, desiring to go to God, prayed to be able to cross and this is why it's called a legend, uh, the river dried up. According to a differing legend, Alban was thirsty and a spring rolled up to quench his thirst. So water is a running theme of these uh, legends. Whatever actually happened, um, the soldier who was ordered and about to behead Alban, was Alban even, was so awed um, that he refused to do his job. So there was definitely something about this new convert, this uh, future saint. Um, that made people at least uneasy or questioning about their own like strongly held convictions. So this um, ex this uh, executioner became a Christian himself on the spot, and that that's like key to the power of martyrdom. Actually, um, a second soldier who um, was found who cut off both of their heads basically, so it didn't extend. Um, and legend says that the eyes of the soldier who struck the deadly blow immediately. Uh, fell out. Although, <laughs> yeah, we like a legend uh, in England. Meanwhile, the priest, like back at the ranch, as it were, Amphib Amphibolus, um, heard, you know, hearing that Album was to die instead of him in his place, he hurried along to the place of execution, like, well, maybe ill-advised, um, and he offered himself up. And guess what? He too was killed. Like, oh, <laughs> shucks. So modern research, um, you know, I guess um, in spite of legend, indicates that the deaths took place um, on the 22nd of June in the year 209. Um, so early third century, uh, before Rome, obviously before Rome had ceased persecution of Christians, uh, at, I think it was Constantine's um, conversion. So impressed by these events, Alban's judge, ordered the persecution to stop. So we got um, got a run on that, as it were, to avoid the rush. And although the date and other details um, have, there, there are questions around them, whether they're kind of shaky or not, there's no, there's not much doubt, I should say, among scholars that he existed um, and that he was a Christian and that he was a Christian martyr. And his story um, was known around Verulam, uh, which later became St Albans, in the century right up after his death, immediately after his death, and he was mentioned in early writings and churches were built in his honour. Um, and the British historian Gildas and the Saxon historian Bede, who's pretty like much more well known, both mention him in their histories, which is also obviously attestation to his um, existence and martyrdom. So now I think we do have time. We're going to look at... Um, Let's see, let me get up to the top. We're going to look at Blandina. I believe I made, I've got a feeling I've made a video about her specifically, but we're going to have a look anyway. So uh, 
she was a slave girl. She was in an amphitheater. She was tortured. Um, and whilst, you know, in the midst of her pain and suffering and, you know, embarrassment and in, like all of the other things that must come along with it, she, her words were recorded as this, I am a Christian and there is nothing vile done by us. So I imagine at that point they were, you know, generally um, like disparaging Christians. So even though the crowd um, basically detested Christians, they were forced to admit like that this woman, um, that basically, I don't think they'd ever seen a woman like it enduring all of this stuff and still standing firm on the gospel. So that this was in, in the year 177 uh, AD in Lyon, which was in Gaul, but is obviously now modern day France. Um, Christianity, yeah, it, it was present, but, but only just. It had first come to Lyon um, a quarter of a century prior to that um, when Polycarp, I hope you've heard of him, of Smyrna, which is now Turkey, um, had sent Pothinus. And that was a he said he was sent as a missionary to Gaul in its entirety, not specifically Lyon. So Pothinus had established the Church of Christ in Lyon and in nearby Vienne. And as that church grew, the spiritual resistance, um, which like Satan's pretty well known for, but it, it became secularized, as it were, and it began to mount. And the persecution of Christians uh, became um a feature of this place, whereas previously it hadn't been so. Um, Christians were shut out of their businesses. They were evicted from their houses. They endured all kinds of shame and dishonor and personal injury. Um, mobs formed to beat them, pretty much like in India nowadays, I guess, or in some places in India. Um, you know, they were stoned. They were robbed. They were just basically um, mistreated to the extreme. And when believers were arrested and examined, by the authorities within that city, they, again, just boldly confessed their faith in Christ. There was nothing that would deter them from doing so. And they were imprisoned uh, at that point to await the arrival of the governor of the region. So some of the um, servants of Christians, the house, you know, the housemaids, etc., who were non-Christian were also, by extension, um, arrested just for working for Christians. Uh, so they were seized and imprisoned and they feared being tortured. And unfortunately, because they're like, I don't know, their moral compass wasn't like uh, centered in the gospel. They um, devised just the fear of torture. They devised like many, many false accusations against their employers, the Christians, um, such as uh, the tried and tested cannibalism uh, incest, obviously, and other like much more shameful practices, to be honest. Um, and these accusations, unsurprisingly, to be fair, enraged the mob even more um, prior to the arrival of the governor. So in this region and in that time, in that year, August the 1st was a holiday and it was a holiday in remembrance or to celebrate the greatness of Rome and of the emperor. And the governor was expected to be patriotic or especially patriotic by sponsoring the entertainment for the entire city, like as a show of, um, I don't know, opulence maybe or, or whatever. So it was expensive, obviously, to hire gladiators, uh, wrestlers, boxers, other like fighting uh, people for these spectacles, this entertainment. However, it would be a lot cheaper um, to just torture the Christians as part of the holiday entertainment. It's ridiculous. Um, so they were confined um, in the most awful, um, darkest, dingiest, dampest, um, disease-ridden area of the prison. Many of them suffocated there. That's attestation to the conditions that they were placed in. Some were placed in stocks, if anybody's unaware of what stocks are. They're like a wooden a couple of cross beams. There's two. Some of them have got holes for feet, definitely a head, a head hole, as it were, for your neck. So then the wood comes down, then your arms are attached in this fashion, and then potentially your feet, your ankles also. Where I grew up, there used to be some, um, not, not, be, not in use, obviously, but they were used... Uh, 
at least in London, they would uh, the people in the stocks would be pelted with rotten vegetables, etc., for whatever misdemeanor um, they'd been convicted of. So it was a, yeah, a form of uh, civil punishment. So some of them were placed in stocks. Others were placed in a hot iron uh, seat where their flesh was obviously burned off. Um, and this was literally like a human barbecue. They were chained over a grate of burning coals. So similar to like a pig in a lua, I don't know, like just, you know, roasted meat, basically. Um, an example of this, like, barbarous, is that a good enough word? Like, I don't know. This torture instrument is um, available today if you happen to be in Lyon at the Archaeological Museum there. So it seemed impossible that any any Christians would live at this point, having all been tortured so, like, horrifically. And yet um, they were strengthened by the Lord and they exhorted each other and they encouraged each other even then in their faith. So Pothinus, um, who you remember was the missionary, um, the 92-year-old bishop of Leon at this point, um, he died in his prison cell two days after his torture at the judgment seat, which again was the uh, basically sitting um, and having the flesh of your backside uh, burned off. Um, and that cell as well can be visited uh, today, COVID restrictions notwithstanding. And it's about the size, this instrument of, um, it's just like tinsy, it's like a washing machine or a dishwasher. Um, and that's that's the cell, that's, that's what he was brought out of. And this is, I guess, how people suffocated because he would have, I mean, he was a bishop of Lyon. So he would have been afforded potentially ever so slightly, you know, preferential treatment. Um, and maybe he got to be in his cell alone. But basically, we're talking not even like 60 centimetres across, maybe an 80 deep, something like that. Just a, just a cupboard, just a, you couldn't, you couldn't sit down and you certainly couldn't lie down. And to be fair, it was that cramp that he couldn't have even stood up straight. So it must have just been horrific, um, although not in comparison to being burned alive. So Sanctus, who is uh, from Vienne at that time, he was a deacon. He stood firm also um, in his faith, even after these red hot plates, oh gosh, were fastened to, let's go with the most tender parts of his body. Um, and basically he was just one complete bruise and wound. There was not much of him that was uninjured. He was an example, that I'm reading a quote now, for the others, showing that there is nothing fearful where the love of the Father is and nothing is painful where there is the glory of Christ. And I would add to that, perfect love casts out fear perfectly. So obviously there will be no fear where the Father, you know, where God truly is. Um, or if there is, it's, uh, you know, it, it's not needed. So after enduring this torture, um, some of these Christians who were still standing at least were taken to the amphitheater where um, they were devoured by wild beasts and that was in order to entertain the crowd. Um, and among this, so we're getting there now, among the group was the slave girl who I referenced at the beginning, her name is Blandina, or was Blandina, or still is Blandina, who'd already endured, I've got to tell you, every imaginable cruelty and torture that was available uh, for them to use. She was uh, suspended on a stake. She was exposed to these wild beasts. And because she appeared to be hanging on a cross and because of the intensity of her prayers, she was an inspiration to other Christians. And when they looked at her, obviously they were reminded of Christ's sacrifice for them and for us. Um, and they would have, uh, it would have come to mind, I assume, that everyone who suffers for the glory of Christ will enjoy eternal fellowship with the living God, basically. None of the beasts touched her um, at the time and she was taken down from the stake and cast back into prison. And the Christians believed that God had preserved her for other contests so that her victory, you know, over this evil uh, might be greater when it came. So on the last day of the contests in the amphitheater, Blandina was again brought in with uh, Ponticus, who was a boy around 15 years of age at the time. And every day they'd been brought to witness the sufferings of the others, basically, and pressed to deny their faith and to swear by these idols. Um, Ponticus died first of the two, 
Blandina remained to the last. Um, she'd encouraged basically everyone at that point, or all the Christians at least, and she saw them, um, you know, going on ahead of her to Christ. Um, and so now, now that she knew she was the last, she was also ready to go. And uh, she faced her death rejoicing um, as if being called to the wedding feast as opposed to um, wild beasts. So the report stated that after the scourging um, and after the wild beasts, after the roasting seat, she was finally enclosed in a net and thrown in front of a bull. Having been tossed around by the animal, um, but this is the, the report of the time, but feeling none of the things that were happening to her on account of her hope and firm hold upon what she had been entrusted um, and her communion with Christ, she also was sacrificed. Big in the game, this woman. So after the bodies of the witnesses were exposed then for six days, they were burned to ashes and thrown into the Rhone River. And the bodies of those who'd suffocated in prison were thrown to the dogs and guards were stationed to prevent the remaining Christians who were living uh, from burying them even because um, they just deserved no respect whatsoever. And the pagans um, hoped that by these events they would um, prevent the hope of the resurrection, basically, the hope that we have in Christ. They'd obviously not read that um, there is no greater love than that a man lays down his life for that of his friends because, uh, well, maybe they should have been reading more or learning to read or just stop being pagans, basically. But... Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to stop there because um, it's pretty distressing, really. She's, she's pretty impressive um, as it goes. Like, if you have to be martyred, go out in style, I guess. I don't know. Like, just literally savaged by a wild beast, have your backside burnt off, like uh, hung on a cross, you know, all of this stuff, and then just, just netted up like some sort of, I don't know what, and chucked in front of a raging bull. But apart from that, she was having a good day because she was rejoicing.